Hello everyone and welcome to this new video about abstract algebra. So in the last video we talked about some pretty important um, uh, properties of isomorphisms and we said that we can use these properties to prove that for example some groups are not isomorphic. Um, so let's actually do that and let's give some examples. So the first example that we're going to give it's actually pretty simple to grasp intuitively and it's the following. In particular we're going to claim that uh, the integers under addition is not isomorphic to the uh, rational numbers uh, under addition. So the reason why that is the case, and we can see it immediately, it's because this group is cyclic, but this is not. And so by the very fact we have seen that if G is isomorphic to H and G is cyclic, then H is cyclic. So if that is not the case, then that means that they're not isomorphic. So this is why, for example, the integers under addition are not isomorphic to the uh, rational numbers under addition. Let's also give another example. We're going to claim that the symmetric, the symmetric group uh, S4, so the group of permutation of four elements, is not isomorphic to D12. So notice that uh, the two um, groups have the same order because the, the order of D12 is just 24. It's the dihedral group of order 24, and the order of S4 is 4 factorial, which is 12 times 2, which is <coughs> which is 24. So the order is equal. So we cannot say anything about the order, because if the order was not the same, we could have immediately said they're not isomorphic. Um, let's, so let us try to find something else. But here, the I mean, the thing which we can use um, in order to prove that they're not isomorphic is pretty simple. And it's just that, well, recall what the elements of D12 are. So we have the identity rotation, then R, then R squared, dot, 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 and so on, up to R11. And then you have all the reflections, okay, like this. Okay, but notice that the order of R is 12. Because if you're the first positive integer for which uh, uh, you, you get back the identity by raising it R to a power is 12. But notice that, on the other hand, for the permutations uh, of... Um, so for the permutations in S4, uh, notice that you cannot have <coughs> an element of order uh, 12. And you can see it pretty easily if you remember all those properties that we proved about the composition of permutations into disjoint cycles and the fact that the order is then the LCM of the, or of the lengths of these this, this joint cycles and so on. So from this we can then deduce that the two groups are not isomorphic. Now let's give yet another example. This one is super simple, but we're going to just give it as a as a demonstration of another way in which we can prove that two groups are not isomorphic. And let's, for example, take S4 and, for example, D13. In this case, this is very trivial. The reason why these two groups are not um, isomorphic is because their orders are different. So we cannot even construct a bijection from one to the other. So with, with these three examples, I hope it's clear how we can use these properties in order to uh, prove that um, groups are not isomorphic. And now that we've proven this, we're going to prove a very important result in um, abstract algebra, but specifically in uh, group theory. And this is Calais theorem. So we're going to state it here. And that is every group is isomorphic to a group of permutations. So now we're going to prove it. And uh, and this proof is actually a constructive proof. This means that we are actually going to construct um, the uh, group <coughs> uh, of permutations which will be isomorphic to uh, our group. So the group we're going to construct is known as a left regular representation. And the way in which we're going to construct it is starting by defining a function for all small g in our group g. We're going to define the following function as such. We're going to call it t of g, and then it's going to take a value again in g, so we're going to say tg of x, is defined as g times x multiplying g on the left, and this basically uh, takes uh, our an input uh, in x in g. So we're going to prove that, first we're going to prove that this function is a permutation of g, and let's uh, and so if you recall, we said that in the video about permutations, permutations are basically bijections uh, from one set to itself. Um, and so all we have to, to show is that basically that this is a bijection from G to itself. So the first thing that we have want to prove is surjectivity. So let's suppose that, for example, we have a 
uh, L in uh, G, well then, does there exist an element such that Tg of x tilde is equal to L? Well, let's see at the form of Tg of x. The answer is yes, because we can take uh, our element x, we can say then there exists x that is equal to um, g to the minus 1 of L, such that Tg of g to the minus 1 of L is equal to g of g to the minus 1 of L, but this is just the identity, so this in the end is equal to L. So we have shown that this, 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 this mapping is subjective. So for the injectivity, we're going to suppose, uh, actually going to prove well-definedness first, so we're going to suppose that x is equal to y, well, but then we're going to have that g times x, is gonna, multiplying uh, g on the left to get that g times x is equal to g, ta y, g times y, but it's just t of g of x, and this is just t of g of y, and so we have proven that it is well-defined. And for, on the other hand, for injectivity, we're gonna suppose that g of x is equal to g of y, in other words, tg of y is equal to g, tg of x. But then, by left cancellation, which holds on groups, we're going to get that x is equal to y. In other words, the function is injective. So the function is a bijection. And so tg is a permutation on uh, the set g, on the elements of g. So uh, now we know that this is a permutation, we're going to claim something else. We're going to claim that this, this, this set, um, which is the, the, the set of all functions tg, with g coming from our group g, is a group under function composition, uh, which is just, you know, the product of permutations, uh, as we called it in the, in the video about symmetric groups and permutations, so under function composition. And so let's prove this. And the fact that this is a group follows very easily from just a property, and it's the following. So let's uh, consider, for example, two elements of G. So, for example, G and G tilde inside of small g, and we're going to basically consider the following uh, function, the function where we act uh, with uh, respect to G and then to G tilde on a value x of the group. So, now let's see what happens. This is just T of G of G tilde x by the definition of this function that we define. And then this is, again, G times um, G tilde x, but again, by the associativity property of our group, we can write this as g times g tilde times x, but this is just t times g times g tilde of x. So, in general, the following property holds. So, basically, the if we take the composition of a mapping associated, so the, a composition of two mappings associated to two elements, then the mapping that we get is the mapping uh, of the uh, t with respect to the product of the elements. So this is in mathematical notation. Maybe it's easier in mathematical notation than trying to explain it. So keeping this in mind, we can immediately derive that our identity uh, of, of for our group will be t of e. Why is that? Because if we take t of e for uh, of t of g of x for any g in our g, then the, what, what this is going to be, this is going to be t of e, um, this is going to be, by this property here, it's going to be t of g of x. And again, even if we take t of g of t of e of x, this is still going to be t of g. And so, this is the identity. And for the inverse, on the other hand, uh, for any g in g, the inverse of t of g will just be equal to t of g to the minus 1. So, these two things prove that um, this set, the, the, that set under function composition is actually a group. So now that we have this, all we have to show is that now this group is isomorphic to our original group phi. And to do this, we're gonna we want to construct a function uh, from G to this group here that we're gonna call like maybe big T. Uh, actually, let's call it just T, okay. Okay, so, uh, and, and this, this isomorphism is actually very easy to construct just by the way in which we constructed everything basically. We can just map for any g in g, we can map it our g in our original group to the function t of g. So now all we have to show is that this, that this function is operation preserving and bijective. Well, operation preserving, uh, it's, the fact that it's operation preserving is pretty simple to prove uh, since we have already shown this property here. Um, but let's consider, for example, phi of g times g tilde. This is just t of g times g tilde. But this is equal to t of g times t of g tilde. And this is just phi of g times phi of g tilde. So, again, um, th th this function is operation preserving. Let's now prove that it's bijective. So, um, but objectivity, um, we're going to have that well for the surjectivity. 
it is clear why that is the case from the very construction that we uh, from the very way in which we constructed our function so we're just going to prove that it's injective and for for injectivity we're going to suppose that for example the um, t of g is going to be equal to t of g tilde um, for another element and for elements g and g tilde in our group g uh, but that but if that is the case then these functions are equal meaning that they're going to be equal for all their basically ev evaluations at any input this means that t of g of the identity is going to be equal to t of g tilde of the identity but this implies that g times identity is equal to g tilde times uh, times identity and this implies that g is equal to g tilde so we're going to have that the function is subjective and injective in other words it's a bijective function and from this we get that um, our group t is isomorphic to g and so this concludes the proof. And we have that eff effectively every group is isomorphic to a group of permutations. This is a very important result in group theory because it actually links the genetic, we could say, ev evolution of the idea of group, which actually started out as just as the study of group of permutations, to the modern abstract uh, formulation of the concept of a group that we study nowadays. So, so with this said, we could say we have proven one of the very important results of this video. And now that we have done this, we're going to pass to another very important topic, and that is automorphisms and automorphism groups. So we're going to start by defining what an, item, what an automorphism is. And actually, there's a lot of notions of these, we could say, of these morphisms that apply not only to groups, but in general to more general mathematical structures. Um, you will see that when you will pass on to study, for example, category theory. Um, so far, we've only seen uh, homomorphisms, isomorphisms, and automorphisms, but there's actually more, for example, hypermorphisms, endomorphisms, and so on. Um, and well, this notion of automorphism is actually very simple. And an, automor an automorphism is basically just a, uh, an isomorphism from a group to itself. And so you can denote it, for example, as phi from G to itself. So just a, um, so it's basically a bijective function, which is operation preserving from a group to itself. Uh, and this is all there is to it. We're going to give some examples. So again, the identity function uh, from group to itself is an automorphism. Uh, why? Because, well, it's, it's bijective. Uh, and not only that, but it's also operation preserving because uh, if we take the identity function of x times y, that's gonna just ju that is just gonna be x times y, but that is the identity of x times the identity of y. So this is an example of a automorphism. Another example of an automorphism could be uh, if we took, for example, the group of couples of couplets in complex numbers. So basically, the order pairs of this form with z and w, with z and w coming from the complex numbers, then if we take uh, the following function um, from C2 to C2, defined in the following way, defined in taking in a couplet like this, and basically spinning out the couplet reverse, the couplet reversed, so w and z, we're going to claim that this is an automorphism. So, um, actually, uh, the, the fact that it's bijective is pretty much trivial, so we're not going to prove that. We're going to prove that it's operation preserving. So let's see why that is the case. So, for example, if we take, um, <coughs> uh, for example, well, here, if, if you want to be more precise, actually, I forgot to specify that I'm taking this group with respect to component wise addition. Um, but so, for example, if we take um, this function of a sum of, couple, of couplets of these tuples, like this. Let's see what we get. So, uh, this is actually by the definition of component-wise addition that we defined on this on, on this uh, set. This is the following, which is just the entry swap, basically, like this. But now let's see um, what happens if we take this plus this, and this is just yields the same result because this is just w z plus w tilde z tilde and that it, these two are the same and so we can see that this function is operation preserving so now that we have given some uh, and actually now i'm going to give another very important example of automorphism and that is conjugation in the complex um in the complex numbers so i'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of conjugation in the complex number it's uh, basically 
this map here uh, from the complex number to the complex number that sends a complex number a plus bi to a minus bi. So if we're going to visualize it graphically, if we have a complex number, uh, we could say graphically representable like this, it's just going to take, this is going to be its conjugate graphically. So now we're going to claim that this is an automorphism, that, so that conjugation is an automorphism. Let's see whether that is the case, because if we take the, for example, the uh, conjugation, um, actually we're going to first prove that it's bijective. So let's suppose that we have a z and uh, the complex numbers, and we can write it as, for example, as x plus i times y. Well, then we want to show that there exists a zeta in still in the complex numbers such that zeta is equal to z. It's actually, zeta bar is going to be equal to z. Um, but this zeta actually exists. This is just x minus i times y. And so we've shown that this is subjective. So to show that it is injective, um, actually, we're going to first prove that it's well defined. So let's suppose that z is equal to w. Then what we're going to have is that, uh, well, z. Uh, bar and let's call z x plus y um, and uh, w x tilde plus i y tilde. So z bar is just going to be equal to x minus i y and um, w bar is going to be equal to x tilde minus y tilde. But we suppose that these two are equal by the definition of equality uh, by all the standard equivalence relation on the complex numbers. This means that x is equal to x tilde and y is equal to y tilde. But uh, again, in here, applying the concept of equality of complex numbers and using this fact here, we conclude that these two are equal. And so it, it is well defined as a function. And to show injectivity, we can use a very similar way, just starting out uh, in, in the reverse direction, basically. We're going to suppose first that uh, the, the conjugate of two elements are the same. Then we're going to reach an expression of this way, but of this form. But here, applying equality of complex numbers, we're going to reach our result. So the function is a bijection. Let's now prove that it actually um, preserves addition. Uh, so it preserves the group operations. Um, so let's uh, take, for example, the conjugate of two complex numbers like this. Let's see what it yields. This is just the conjugate of a plus c plus b plus d times i. And this is just a plus c minus b plus d times i. Now let's take the individual conjugates, that is a minus bi plus c minus di, but in the end we get the same result. And so from this we conclude that it is also operation preserving. So from this we it follows that uh, conjugation of complex numbers, so the natural we could say involution that we uh, define the complex numbers, which is conjugation, uh, is uh, a, an automorphism. Complex conjugation actually turns out to be more than just a group automorphisms. Group automorphism. It turns out to be a, a field automorphism. You're gonna see that when we're gonna um, define fields. Um, but for now, don't worry. But that is just another algebraic structure, and this is another, uh, again a uh, thing which, from which you can also understand that all these notions that we're seeing right now, such as isomorphisms and homomorphisms, also apply to other structures as well. And uh, that is because actually conjugation of a, also preserves products and a field in, in, and fields are algebraic structures uh, which satisfy axioms with respect to two operations to two binary operations and these are for example in the case of complex numbers complex numbers form a field under addition and multiplication and um, well and in some axiomatic formulations of um, we could say of mathematics uh, the only automorphisms of the complex numbers are conjugation and identity as field automorphisms. Uh, but then there's some automorphisms which, uh, if you use the axiom of choice, are called uh, wild automorphisms, which, which are, however, not very well behaved. So when I, I don't think we're, we're going to even look into this stuff in, in this uh, a series of videos because uh, this is a very basic introduction to group theory. So um, we're going to give yet another example. And in this example, we're going to take our automorphism to be to be the conjugation of a um, quaternion under uh, the group we're taking is the quaternions under addition. So, a conjugation of a quaternion is defined in the same way as the conjugation of a complex number, pretty much. And it's again an involution. 
and it is an anthropomorphism of groups with respect to the quaternions with respect to uh, classic addition like this. So addition of quaternions is defined as such. Uh, like this. So if you have a quaternion A plus B I plus C J plus D K plus A tilde plus B tilde I plus C tilde J plus D tilde K, then you're just gonna sum the um, the components of the like terms like like this, and so on. So I'm I'm sure it's clear, but I'm actually gonna complete that just to make it clearer. So like this, and. With respect to this uh, group, this is an automorphism. That is because, well, for the same reasons for which we proved it for the complex numbers, this is a bijection. That is because, well, it is of course well defined, and uh, if we have two quaternions q and q bar, uh, actually q tilde, then we're gonna have the q, and um, we're gonna have an infinitely if a relationship between the quality of the conjugates and the quality of the actual two quaternions. And therefore, the preservation of the addition is again very similar to the proof with respect to complex numbers, so we're not going to prove it. And now we're going to have to be a little bit more careful because with quaternions, on the other hand, uh, well, of course, well, first of all, quaternions are not a field, but with respect to the, we could say, um, with respect to the algebraic structure that, we've, that they form, respect also to the product, and, and we will actually see later what kind of structure they are algebraically. Um, well, with respect to that structure, this actually forms what, what is known as an anti-automorphism. That is because, well, quaternions, for example, are not commutative. So what you have is that if you have two quaternions Q and, for example, R, and you take their conjugate, then what you get is the conjugate of R first and then the conjugate of Q. So this is, um, again, uh, another example of automorphism of groups. But in this case, this is not an automorphism, we could say, of the bigger structure, of the bigger canonical structure that we take algebraically on the quaternions. So now we've discussed a little bit of examples of uh, automorphisms. Let's actually prove some theorems about them. The first one is that, the, uh, I'm going to state it like this, that is the set of automorphisms, the set of automorphisms of a group, so defined like this, uh, basically phi of respect to g and phi is an automorphism. This is a group. So let's see why that is the case. So the first thing that we have to check is that this uh, is closed. So let's take phi and psi and out of G, so the two automorphisms. Well then, there uh, we want to check that this is closed, so closure. Um, so we're going to check that their composition is still an automorphism. So the fact that it's still a function from G to G is trivial, but the fact that it's still an isomorphism is uh, from a theorem that we proved in the last video. So this is actually already checked. So it, we don't have to do anything for closure. Let's see uh, identity. Well, by the identity we have it, it's just the identity function, which is the function that goes from G to G, which maps small g in G to G for all G in G. And so we have an identity element. Uh, let's check for an inverse. We have an inverse because for all phi in out of G, well, we have a theorem that we proved in the last video that phi to the minus one, that is still an automorphism from G to G because we know that given an isomorphism, its inverse is an isomorphism. And well, it's easy to show that, well, well at this point we know that combining them uh, like this, we get the identity. And so we have an inverse, and then we have that, of course, the operation of function composition is associative. And so we have that this is a group, and so we can uh, label this as proven. And now that we have shown this theorem, we're not going to prove another one, which is a pretty important theorem about automorphism groups. <coughs> and that is the following. And uh, if we have two groups, G and H, isomorphic to each other, then we're going to have that also their automorphism groups are going to be isomorphic to each other. So let's prove this. The proof of this fact is again pretty simple, and we're going to prove it in the following way. So, by hypothesis, we have a, a an isomorphism uh, phi from G to H. Then we're going to have we're going to expand a little bit more on the definition of these automorphism groups, and we're going to call well the automorphism group of G is going to be all the item, automorphisms f from G to G, and similarly like this. So G automorphism, and here f is an automorphism. So we have this. Um, now, what we want to do is we want to construct an, auto an isomorphism between these two groups here. So how can we do that? 
So now we want to construct an automorphism from the automorphism group, an isomorphism, sorry, from the automorphism group of G to the automorphism group of H. Um, so ideally, we want to take a function from G to G to a function from H to H. So how can we do that? Well, we're going to actually do our biggest concern is actually generating a function from h to h starting from a function from g to g because then we're going to do that via some uh, concatenation of um, compositions but we're going to see that is not a, a big trouble because we have a lot of results that show that compositions uh, of isomorphisms are isomorphisms and inverses of isomorphisms are isomorphisms so we're good for that so let's just try to build a function from h to h so we have a function from g to g so this one uh, but now we have a function from G to H, which is an isomorphism by hypothesis, this one right here. So if we compose, for example, um, uh, phi to F, we're going to get a function from G to H. But where, for example, you can imagine this as being an element of G. Okay, so let's see this as a picture, for example, because graphical intuition helps a lot. And imagine you have this element here, A of G. Okay, but now imagine that before you send it to H, so phi would just send it to H straight away. F, sorry. Well, our function phi will just send it to H straight away. We're actually going to do something different. What we're going to do is we're going to send it first with F to another element, which is an automorphism, that is automorphism F. And then we're going to send it with phi to an element phi composed with f of a here. And we're going to do it with all elements, basically. And then this is going to get sent here. OK, so we have now a function from g to h. But we have a problem. This function is from g to h. Uh, we want a function from h to h. So probably we will want to start from here. But we have a way to start from here. All we have to do is to apply uh, phi to the minus 1. And this is an isomorphism. So what we do is actually, we're going to take this, but this is going to be our second step. We're going to first start from H. So we're going to make another graphical picture in order to explain it better. So this is our H group, and this is our G group. Okay, so we're going to start from H. We have our element of H, small h. Now, we're going to map our element small h via phi to the minus 1 to phi to the minus 1 of h. Now, we're going to map phi to the minus 1 with f via the automorphism f to f uh, composed with phi to the minus 1 of h, or small h, and then we're going to send it back with phi to another point, maybe here. And we're going to call it uh, phi composed with f composed with phi to the minus 1 of small h. So this is the cycle we're going to go. So all this... Um, we could say all this cumbersome operation, which we're going to express in mathematical form as phi composed with f composed with phi to the minus 1. So we're going to construct this function, a function of functions, which you can think of as just taking the function and applying, sandwiching it between these two isomorphisms, composition of isomorphisms. We're going to want to show... We want to show that this is an isomorphism. In particular, it's an, it's an isomorphism from the group of automorphisms of G to the group of automorphisms of H. So... This is fairly simple to show. The first thing that we notice is that this is actually an isomorphism. That is because phi is an isomorphism. Um, so phi is an isomorphism. F is an isomorphism. In particular, it's an automorphism. And phi to the minus 1 is an isomorphism. Why? Because inverses of, of isomorphisms are still isomorphisms. So this, in total, is an isomorphism. And, well, actually, we have just shown what we wanted to show. Uh, because this maps a... Uh, a function and automorphism from out of G to an automorphism of out of H. And so this actually just proves the theorem. I think the only important th part about this theorem is understanding how we reach this expression here. So this is one of the first important theorems about uh, automorphisms. But before we pass to, follow to the next theorem is that uh, be, aware, be aware of that uh, about the fact that um, two groups, if two groups are isomorphic, uh, then yes, their automorphism groups are going to be also isomorphic as well. But if um, 
two isom automorphism groups of two groups that we have are isomorphic, then that does not imply, in general, that the groups are isomorphic. So be, be careful, this is not an if and only if relationship, this is just one way. Um, okay, so now we're going to prove another important fact. And this one is about the automorphism groups of a group that we know pretty well, and that is the group of integer uh, integer under additions module n. We're going to prove that the automorphism groups, the automorphism group of this group is uh, isomorphic to the uh, group of um, integers under multiplication module n. So we're going to prove it. And again, here we're going to. You could say we're gonna prove it by constructing our, our isomorphism um, explicitly. So we notice that our group Z of n is gonna be of the following form: it's gonna be a zero, then one, then two, dot dot dot, up to n minus one. It's gonna be a group of order n, and fundamentally, this is a cyclic group. So we can write every element as just a sum of ones. Okay, but this implies, uh, if we w com consider that we want to find an automorphism of this group, if we want to find an automorphism of, the gr of this group and we can write every element as just a um, sums, sums of ones, well then, if we want to find a general, uh, the general image of an element of this group under this automorphism, uh, and our x could be, uh, we're going to write first our x as just sums of one, x times and so this in the end just yields x times phi of 1 this is by the properties of isomorphism because we're supposing that this is an automorphism we want to find an automorphism but notice here the image of every element only basically the only thing that we care about is the uh, we could say the image so what phi of 1 gets mapped to and now well, we want to basically determine this, and by determining this, by determining the possibilities that we have, um, the possibilities, uh, so the possibility, the possible uh, elements uh, with respect to which one can be associated to, mm -hmm. then by considering these possibilities, we're gonna actually build our isomorphism. So let's start by uh, noting that oh, we have a restriction first of all, and let's keep this in mind. And this is again by a fact that we proved in the last video. That is, remember, isomorphisms, so in particular automorphisms, uh, preserve preserve orders. This means that if we have an element of z of n of order ten over of, of order five, then the image under phi of that element cannot be of order three. It has to be of order five. And well, notice that our element one, since it generates the group, and the group is of, is of order n, then this element has order n. What that means is that the order of v of 1 has to be of order n. Now we ask something. Well, but what elements of z of n are of order n? The answer is all elements which are relatively prime with respect to n. Which means all the possible choices. So we can say v of 1 is going uh, is going to live in this set here. So it's going to live in the set of uh, positive integers uh, m, such that the GCD of m and n is one. In other words, all the positive integers m, which are co-prime to n. Um, but let's notice something. This should remind you of a group, uh, and this group, uh, actually of the underlying set structure of a group we studied, that is the group of integers modulo uh, n under multiplication. So the multiplicative group modulo n. And it, it is in this way that and it's not clear how we can construct this automorphism. Now, we, all we have to do is just to construct it. And now, trivially, the automorphism that we're going to construct is the following. It's going to be the function that we're going to call t. That's going to map an element uh, of, actually, it's going to map an automorphism, for example, phi, of our group, uh, of, um, our group of automorphisms of Zn to phi evaluated at 1. So here we live in the automorphism group of Zn, and here we live in the multiplicative group module uh, n. So this is our function that will be our isomorphism. Let's now show that this is indeed an isomorphism. We're going to start by showing that this is bijective, as usual. So for, we're going to start by proving that uh, it is injective. So first of all, we're going to suppose that um, we have two elements, phi and phi tilde, inside of our um, group of 
automorphisms. And then we're going to suppose that phi of 1 is going to be equal to phi tilde of 1. In other words, under the, under the uh, function t, they are the same. Uh, but then we have shown before that since, well, for this reason here, um, well, that implies that phi of k is equal to phi tilde of k for all k in the group of uh, integers module n. Why is, why is that? Because k times phi to the 1 is equal to k times phi tilde to, uh, to the 1, and then we can bring it inside. Because um, we said why that, why, why that was the case up here. Why? Because um, this group is cyclic, and by applying the properties of isomorphisms, we easily get this relation here. So from this, it follows that that uh, the two um, automorphisms are equal. Why is that? Because they're equal for all the values of uh, for all the inputs. So they basically just yield the same result, and so they're the same. And uh, now we're going to prove um, surjectivity. But surjectivity is again pretty simple. We're going to suppose we have an element m of u of n, and then the surjectivity is actually very simple because we can we can construct a function phi of x defined as um, x times m mod n, and this is a uh, and this is defined for all x in z of n. This is the um, automorphism that is gonna basically uh, give our m because phi of one is just m, and so we're gonna get m. Uh, the, the only thing which you have to show is that this is actually an automorphism, but this is pretty easy to show. And uh, why is that? Because if we have phi of x plus y, this is just equal to x plus y times m, all mod n. This is just x times m plus x plus y times m mod n. And then this is basically the sum of the functions. So it is operation preserving, and it is um, also subjective and injective. It is injective because if we have, uh, for example, uh, x times uh, m mod n is congruent to y, uh, actually y times m mod n. And then we're going to get that x is congruent to y mod n. And last but not least, this is surjective because multiples of co-prime elements with respect to n, uh, we could say, um, they're basically generators of z of n, and so they have order 10. And so if we sum them uh, enough times, you're going to get all the elements. So this is also subjective. So we have that it's operation preserving, it's subjective and injective, this is an automorphism. So we have shown that this is an automorphism, and thus our function t is also subjective. And now all we have to show is that our function t is also uh, operation preserving. Uh, but this is again very simple. Because if you have T of alpha composed with beta, for example, where alpha and beta are elements of the automorphism group of G of Z of N, well, then this is basically just alpha of um, beta of 1. But this is just alpha of, well, beta of 1, what is that? That's just 1 plus 1 plus dot 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 plus 1, beta of 1 times. And in the end, what we get by the distributive property, we get that this is just alpha 1 plus dot dot plus alpha 1, beta 1 times. And so in the end, this is just alpha 1 times beta 1, which is just T of alpha times T of beta. And so we have shown that this is also operation preserving. We have shown that this is an isomorphism. So in the end, the automorphism group of Z of n is isomorphic to U of n. So with this said, we're going to conclude this video. Since it was pretty long, I'm going to conclude this video with some exercises, which can help you to um, we could say of not only to foster your interest in these we could say more abstract definition but also to understand the uh, to understand them better intuitively and so I'm going to start first by uh, the first exercise is to provide a counterexample to the following argument so provide a counterexample to out uh, so the automorphism group of G uh, isomorphic to automorphism of H implies G automorphism of H. So find a counterexample to this. Show that uh, in general this is not the case. Then a second example show that the integers under addition have infinitely many subgroups isomorphic to the morphic to Z. And then as a last uh, exercise, consider the following uh, group. 
defined in the following way. Actually, you're gonna actually prove that it's a group. Uh, so we're gonna define, given a group G, and given a small g in G, we're gonna get define a function phi of G, uh, defined on a variable x inside the group, uh, to be the following. So it's gonna be the sandwich of this variable inside G and G minus one. And this is called the inner automorphism defined by G. So now, the two things that you can do is first to prove that the set of inner automorphisms uh, of a group, which we're gonna denote as inner of G, of in of G as a shorthand, is a group. And secondly, find a group of inner automorphisms of D4. And so, so with this said, I think this video can now conclude here.